Welcome to Norse Mythology, the unofficial guide. It's unofficial because I'm neither a credentialed academic nor a time-traveling medieval Norse pagan, but I deal with this material directly from the sources, interpreted through the lens of the experts and their opinions. If you're looking for depth and detail in a simple and accessible way, then you're in the right place. At the end of the last episode, I alluded to the idea that today we would start talking about events leading up to Ragnarok. But I've changed my mind. We'll get to that stuff soon, but as we've been going through the mythology story by story, a couple things have started weighing on me a little bit. One is how Thor-centric our corpus is. I worry it could make it seem like I'm not devoting enough time to stories about other characters, when in fact I'm just working my way through all the stories we have that aren't just big lore encyclopedias delivered through dialogue. There are also one or two other things that we have sort of neglected that we need to bring up before Ragnarok occurs. But this leads me to the other thing, which is how male-centric our corpus is, making it feel like we aren't devoting enough time to the goddesses. What's funny about that whole setup is that even though most of the preserved myths focus more on the men, when we tally up all of the goddesses mentioned in the sources, we actually come up with about 30 different characters, whereas there are only about 20 different gods we know about mentioned in those same sources. These numbers are approximations, of course, because not everything is always perfectly clear. But I thought now might be a good time to start introducing a few of the lesser-known female deities in the Norse tradition, just to break things up a bit. There are a bunch that we could talk about, so I may end up doing a few more episodes like this one in the future. But to start, I'm going to be relying largely on a few articles written by Joseph S. Hopkins, published as a series in the RMN newsletter that he titled Goddesses Unknown. Like most things, though, before we start talking specifically about these characters, we should probably establish a little context. Scholars of the past have had a tendency to focus a lot more effort on studying male characters from the Norse sources than female ones. On the one hand, this is somewhat understandable as a natural result of the fact that the sources contain a lot more information and stories about a select few of the males. But on the other hand, there was also a really weird scholarly push starting around the mid-1800s to find some reason to believe that all goddesses ought to be merged together into a single goddess figure somewhere in the distant past. And not just Norse goddesses. The idea actually started in the field of Greek mythological studies, and at its most extreme, one proponent of the idea named Johann Bakhoven advanced a theory that every culture in the world must have individually held a tradition of a single great mother goddess at some point in the distant past, who eventually split into all the individual deities known to that culture. This so-called great goddess theory seems to imply an idea of original matriarchy, which understandably looks attractive at face value from the feminist angle. And for that reason, it resurfaced a little bit in a milder form in the second half of the 20th century. But there are a few problems with it. For one, its roots are far from feminist. Bakafen himself viewed this type of matriarchal system as something mankind needed to evolve away from in order to achieve a more advanced modern society. And in general, the theory has never been met with any kind of widespread acceptance in the modern academic community and is rarely ever mentioned today. One potential reason for this is that there seems to be no real rational explanation for why we should try to merge all the females into a single character, but not the males. It's an idea that, while striving to provide evidence for some ancient idea of European matriarchy, requires us to strip ancient societies of their ability to venerate women in equal numbers and roles as they did men. As we push towards finding the one great goddess, we accidentally sacrifice the individualities and the uniqueness assigned to the numerous goddesses actually attested in our sources, assuming that such and such is just another name for so and so, and that this goddess over here was forgotten in favor of that goddess over there. This is not to say that matriarchy never occurred anywhere in ancient Europe, of course, and there are bound to be moments here and there where one figure does split into two, or a couple different figures merge into one for one reason or another. But this can happen with males just as equally as with females. The reason I bring all this up now is because, as we talk about individual goddesses, especially ones who are a little more obscure, 
a lot of the analysis we have to sift through will unavoidably be looking at similarities between characters and trying to draw relations between them and guessing about where they might have come from. It's important, as we ask those questions, to make sure we aren't accidentally gravitating towards this old weird idea that turns all the women into a single character. I recommend keeping that in mind whenever you hear theories about goddesses in ancient religions. So with that out of the way, let's jump way back in time to a first century Roman I've mentioned a few times before named Tacitus. Tacitus lived hundreds and hundreds of years before the Norse period began, and he wrote a book called Germania that was ostensibly about the Germanic inhabitants of continental Europe. Tacitus, of course, was writing for Romans, from the Roman viewpoint, describing the people he wrote about in Roman terms. And there's some debate about whether or not all the groups he talks about were actually Germanic groups, and about whether various claims he makes are really all that accurate. But in spite of all that, Tacitus provides one of only very few written records describing Germanic people from near the beginning of the first millennium AD. And there are various things he mentions, such as certain types of burials that have since been confirmed to a degree by archaeological finds. So there's definitely some value there. In section 40 of Germania, Tacitus mentions seven Germanic groups who he tells us are unified in their dedicated worship to a goddess he calls Nertus in Latin. Specifically, he tells us, quote, There is nothing especially noteworthy about these states individually, but they are distinguished by a common worship of Nertus, that is, Mother Earth, and believe that she intervenes in human affairs and rides through their peoples. There is a sacred grove on an island in the ocean in which there is a consecrated chariot draped with cloth, where the priest alone may touch. He perceives the presence of the goddess in the innermost shrine, and with great reverence escorts her in her chariot, which is drawn by female cattle. There are days of rejoicing then, and the countryside celebrates the festival wherever she designs to visit and to accept hospitality. No one goes to war, no one takes up arms, all objects of iron are locked away. Then and only then do they experience peace and quiet. Only then do they prize them, until the goddess has had her fill of human society and the priest brings her back to the temple. Afterwards, the chariot, the cloth, and if one may believe it, the deity herself are washed in a hidden lake. The slaves who perform this office are immediately swallowed up in the same lake. Hence arises dread of the mysterious and piety, which keeps them ignorant of what only those about to perish may see." End quote. So, what does a proto-Germanic goddess have to do with Norse mythology? After all, there's no Nertus in the Norse corpus that we know of. Well, if we assume Tacitus's Nertus can be translated into Proto-Germanic Nerthus, this word actually works as an etymological precursor to the name Njorther, who is a pretty well-known Norse god, albeit strangely, Njorther is male, and Tacitus describes Nerthus as female. Njorther also has a pretty strong association with the sea, as we learn from the story about his marriage to Skadi, and here we have Nertus's chariot residing in a sacred grove on an island in the ocean. It's been speculated that this could be a reference to the island of Zealand, which was the seat of the ancient kings of Denmark, and the names of some of the tribes Tacitus mentions as worshippers of Nertus, such as the Angli, also clue us into the idea that we are probably dealing with the area around the Danish peninsula here. So, how exactly does Nertus become Njorther? We can't say for sure what's happening here, but it's interesting, as Hopkins points out alongside other scholars, that the Norse sources also include references to a goddess named Njorun, and also to another wife of Njorther who we are told was his sister. So let's start with Njorun. Njorun appears in a list of goddesses named among the Asir clan in the Prosetta, but we are not given any other information about her at all. Like some other goddesses, her name is sometimes used within kennings and skaldic poetry, which are flowery poetic phrases used to refer to simple things, in this case to denote women, sort of generally. The one reference we have to her name in the Poetic Edda is in the poem Alvismal, where the dwarf Alvis claims that the dwarvish word for night is Draumnjorun, meaning the Njorun of dreams. Unfortunately, this isn't really enough to conclude much of anything, for all we know, Alvis could just have easily have said Draum Freya or Draum Idun. What we can do is take a stab at what the root of her name might mean. McKinnell notes that the root Nerth in Proto-Germanic Nerthus looks like it could be cognate with Old Irish Nert, which means strength. 
And by the way, if two words in different languages are cognate, it means that they are descended from the same origin and often have similar meanings. So in this case, nerthus could mean something like the strong or powerful one, which by extension would apply to nyorther and nyorun possibly as well. Another option is that it could be related to Old English yeneorth, which is a beautiful word, and in which case it could mean something closer to contentment. McKinnell also notes that Tacitus' description of the way the Nertus idol was washed after the festival seems uncomfortably similar to what we know about rituals surrounding Magna Mater in Rome, which was represented by a black stone and which Tacitus was apparently intimately familiar with. McKinnell notes that whereas some have taken this to mean that Tacitus must have invented the whole thing, there are actually a lot of details in his account that are echoed by later Germanic sources and are supported by archaeology. For example, keeping the idol in a sacred grove on an island, the fact that Nerthus is represented by an idol at all, the idol being attended by a single priest of opposite gender to herself, the festival being a unique time of peace and feasting, and the event ending with a human sacrifice in a lake. To explain how the male Njorther evolves out of the female Nerthus, McKinnell's conclusion, which also takes into account things like different spellings in different manuscripts and some more boring stuff like that, is that originally, Nerthus might have had both a male and a female form, something like a twin, as we see echoed later in Njorther's children, Freyr and Freya. This could also potentially explain the existence of the enigmatic Njorun in our sources, as well as any possible female counterpart to Njorther. This idea of a male and female pair of deities with similar names is also reflected in the fact that the Norse corpus gives us both a male and female version of the name of the god Fjörgyn. So this is really not an uncommon idea. Speaking of Freyr and Freya, the poem Lokasena contains an accusation made by Loki that these two have some kind of incestuous relationship. In stanza 32, Loki says this to Freya, quote, be silent, Freya. You're a witch, and much imbued with malice. You were with your brother. All the cheerful gods surprised you, and then, Freya, you farted." End quote. In the next stanza, Njorther chimes in to assert his opinion that this isn't even a big deal. Quote, "...that's harmless if a woman has a husband or a lover or one of each. What's surprising is that a pervert god comes in here and he has born children." End quote. He goes on to mention that his son Freyr is a person who no one hates and is considered a protector of the Asir. But Loki sees this as just another opportunity to double down on the incest accusations. He says, quote, Stop now, Njord. Keep some moderation. I won't keep it a secret any longer. With your sister you got that son, though that's no worse than might be expected. End quote. So, just cruising right on past the glaring question of how Loki was the only person who knew about this and why he had been keeping it a secret, who exactly is Njorther's sister? If Njorther and Njorun are Norse versions of a male and female Nerthus, then they could easily be brother and sister, in which case we would be able to place Njorun into the role of mother for Freya and Freyr. Keep in mind, though, that even though this is a pretty common speculation even among scholars, it's only a speculation, and it's ultimately based on no other evidence than that Njorder and Njorun both have Njor in their names. It's what causes us to think they could both be related to Nerthus, and then everything else follows from that. But Snorri builds upon the idea of incest being commonplace among the Vanir in his Inglinga saga, which I will never stop reminding you is euhemeristic, meaning it is a largely fake history book inspired by Norse mythology. But here's the quote. When Njorther was among the Vanir, he had been married to his sister, for that was the law there. Their children were Freyr and Freya, but it was forbidden among the Asir to cohabit with such close kin." End quote. For a little clarity, this probably isn't supposed to mean there was a law stating a person had to marry a sibling, but more that the law allowed for it, making it something more like a custom. Whether Snorri built this entire idea upon the information provided by Lokasena, or whether it was a more common Norse idea that incest was customary among some group called the Vanir, we can't say for sure. But at the very least, Lokasena does attest that Njorther has a sister by whom he fathered his children, which is why most people tend to presume that when Skadi refers to Freyr as her son in the poem Skirnismal, she may be speaking more in the role of stepmother rather than biological mother. Hopkins also notes that the prose edda contains a quote from a lost poem about Njorther that, for all we know, might have provided more information about his sister. 
But at the same time, he points out that various sources across both Eddas and other euhemeristic accounts all contradict each other about when and where Freya and Freya were born, so it's a complicated thing to figure out. This is one of those instances we talked about in episode 7 where the idea of Vanir gods becomes a confusing problem. To recap, the traditional idea is that the Vanir are a clan of gods or godlike beings who once had a war with the Asir that ended in a truce. Scholars tend to note that deities named as Vanir in the sources, which are specifically Njorther, Freyr, and Freya, are particularly associated with wealth and fertility. However, some scholars diverge from this opinion and have even gone so far as to suggest that we have inherited a misunderstanding of the word Vanir from Snorri, and that it was originally meant to be a synonym for gods. I'll leave it to you to make your own decision on that, but the point is, assuming the traditional idea is correct, it's fun to wonder about whether Njorther's sister is an Asir goddess or a Vanir goddess, and whether her relationship with her brother Njorther had to be broken up when he was traded as a hostage to the Asir after the asir vanir war, and whether she really is Njordun or someone else entirely. One interesting possibility noted by Hopkins draws upon information in Gesta Danorum, which is another euhemeristic history written by Danish author Saxo Grammaticus. Saxo tells a fascinating story about a character named Hattingus that appears to be informed by some of the same information Snorri gives us about Njorther in his own works. According to Saxo, Hattingus has a relationship with his foster sister, who ends up being killed by some mysterious monsters. Later, Hattingus rescues a princess named Regnilda from a giant, and the two of them get married after, as Hopkins says it, a leg-based choosing incident that is similar to Skathi's choice of Njorther's lovely feet. Saxo then adds a poem about their problematic marriage, wherein Hattingus complains about being away from the sea and how he doesn't like the sounds of the wolves, and Regnilda replies that she doesn't like the sea because of the shrieking gulls, which now makes it obviously clear that this part of the Hattingus-Regnilda story is inspired by Njorther and Skadi. Hopkins notes that an earlier scholar named Du Maisel theorized that Saxo might have drawn his information about the death of Hattingus's foster sister, from an older narrative about the death of Njorther's sister wife. But he points out in so many words that it is easily just as likely that Saxo made that piece up. Another name that shows up alongside Njorun in the Prose Edda's list of goddesses is Ilmer. This name is even more obscure in that it never shows up in any surviving Eddic poetry and is only referenced one other time in the Prose Edda in a list of, what else, but kennings for women. Because there isn't much information about her in the Eddas, there aren't a ton of scholarly papers to draw from. However, back in the 1880s, Jacob Grimm took a crack at interpreting her name. And even though his interpretation is a little shaky, it appears to be the best guess anyone's been able to come up with so far. Grimm made the obvious connection between the feminine proper noun Ilmer, serving as the goddess's name, and the masculine common noun, also pronounced Ilmer, which means sweet scent. When these words appear in different grammatical roles, they take different forms, so we can't be sure these aren't just homonyms in certain cases. However, if we expect to find parallels between the Norse tradition and other related Indo-European traditions, then it shouldn't be surprising to find a Norse goddess associated with a sweet scent, given that we see the same thing in the Greek tradition, where Aphrodite is also known for her fragrance, both in literature and in cult practice. Although she doesn't feature in the Eddas, Ilmer shows up nine times in skaldic poetry across works by seven different poets. In at least six of these instances, her name is used as a kenning for a woman, as we might expect. For example, there are phrases like Ilmer Sorva and Ilmer Erma, which mean respectively Ilmer of necklaces and Ilmer of sleeves. Now, most of the time, when we see the kenning formula of name plus clothing or jewelry, we're usually seeing a goddess's name. But sometimes, certain poets will use Valkyrie names in this formula too, and there just so happens to be one verse preserved in Lan Namabok that refers to battle as Ilmar Yalmar, meaning Ilmer's noise or racket. This is exactly the type of kenning we would expect to see referencing Valkyrie names, but not at all what we would expect to see in a kenning referencing a goddess who is not associated with Valkyries. Hopkins notes a point made by Magnussen that if this is a clue that Ilmer is a Valkyrie, then it's odd that she would have a name that means sweet scent, 
Alternatively, he suggests, Ilmer's name could actually be etymologically related to the other word in that kenning, Yalmar, meaning noise. If so, that would put her in line with another Valkyrie named Hlok, which is a name that also means noise or battle, and could help unify this idea of who she is. Another option is that her name could be related to Old Norse Almar, meaning elm tree. If so, we would have yet another fascinating tie-in between supernatural beings and trees. Hopkins points out that this could also explain why Ilmer seems to have faded out of the record we see preserved in the Icelandic Eddas. If she was particularly associated with elm trees, her role might have begun to lose meaning on an island that was so quickly deforested after the arrival of Norse settlers. If we can draw a little cross-Germanic inspiration from the English record on elm trees, we find that in England, elm trees have traditionally been considered treacherous and hostile, probably because healthy-looking elms have a tendency to drop branches out of nowhere that can injure unsuspecting people. But their association with death goes even deeper in the fact that elms are traditionally used in graveyards, and their wood was traditionally used in the past for making coffins. There is even one record of an elm tree that Hopkins highlights in a quote by Watts that, quote, used to be called the prophet tree. It was said to foretell each death in the family of the Eccles, who used to own the place by flinging off a limb, end quote. Hopkins suggests that with the elm being so tightly coupled with death, this interpretation of Ilmer's name works well alongside evidence that she could have been considered a chooser of the slain, a Valkyrie, in the Norse record. Hopkins also discusses one other goddess worth bringing up here, and in this particular case, he takes pretty much the entire scholarly community to task over their treatment of the character Hlin. The trouble begins in Voluspa 51, quote, Then Frigg's second sorrow comes about, when Odin advances to fight against the wolf and Beli's bright slayer against Surt. Then Frigg's dear beloved must fall, end quote. This stanza is describing events at Ragnarok, when Odin is fated to be eaten by the wolf Fenrir. It's a moment described by the poem as Frigg's second sorrow, her first sorrow, of course, being the death of her son Baldr. Except, that's not what the source text actually says. Odin's death is not called the second sorrow of Frigg, but the second sorrow of Hlin. So, why would Larrington replace the name Hlin with Frigg? Well, first of all, it's not just Larrington. Oliver Bray, Jeremy Dodds, and Jackson Crawford all do the same thing in their own translations. This appears to be a real pet peeve of Hopkins, and to be honest, I don't really like these types of so-called corrections of the text either. The reason this happens is because traditionally, scholar after scholar after scholar after scholar has concluded, because this stanza appears to say that Odin's death is Hleen's sorrow and because Odin is Frigg's wife, that Hleen must simply be another name for Frigg, used in this case to facilitate alliteration. If this is correct, then replacing the name is done to prevent confusion. But that's just the thing. Is it correct? As Hopkins notes, your answer to that question probably comes down to how much you trust Snorri. Snorri places the name Hlin alongside the name Frigg in lists of goddesses twice in the Prose Edda, strongly implying that they are not the same character. And in Gilvigenning 35 specifically, He's explaining the roles of various goddesses and includes this information about Hlin. Quote, Twelfth Hlin. She is given the function of protecting people whom Frigg wishes to save from some danger. From this comes the saying that someone who escapes finds refuge. End quote. The word Falx translates to finds refuge here is Hlinir. So what Snorri is saying is that he believes this word Hlinir is derived from the name Hlin. Unfortunately, Hlenir is a hapax legomenon, meaning that it only occurs naturally this one time in all the Old Norse texts that we have, so figuring out exactly what it means is difficult. The most common interpretation is that it's related to the English word lean, as in to lean against something. A couple of alternatives include the idea that Hlin could be related to Old Norse hlun, meaning warmth, or hlinir, meaning maple tree, which is admittedly kind of tempting because it starts to create a pattern of obscure goddess names possibly related to tree names. And as we mentioned before, there's a possibility of a connection between Thor's wife Siv and the Rowan. But all this stuff is very speculative. Hopkins points out that what Snorri tells us about Hlin falls really well in line with what we believe about the Germanic mothers, sometimes called the matrons or matronai. 
These are goddesses we typically find outside of Scandinavia, commonly artistically represented in trios, often carrying items like bread loaves, diapers, and baskets of fruit. The common belief is that these goddesses had protective influence over various areas within the family sphere. In Scandinavia, the concept of the mothers seems to have given rise to this whole Valkyrie Norn Desir complex of women who influence fate and often serve a protective function. If Hleen's role, as Snorri claims, is to protect people that Frigg wants protected, it makes perfect sense why the death of Odin would constitute Hleen's second sorrow, it being a potential case where she was unable to fulfill her responsibility. Hopkins notes that we should not be so quick to assume two characters are the same just because a single stanza in a single poem mentions them both together in an otherwise confusing way. As an example, he brings up the goddess Fula, who we don't have time to go into today, but this is another character who only shows up once in the Poetic Edda in the role of a handmaid for Frigg, but who Snorri calls a virgin goddess in the Prose Edda, and assigns her the role of caring for Frigg's footwear and sharing her secrets. If we had no other sources, it would be pretty easy to assume Snorri misinterpreted Fula as well. But as it turns out, we have a little piece of text called the Second Merseburg Charm that was discovered in Germany and describes an event where Wodan and Balder are riding through a forest, and Balder's horse injures its ankle. A few goddesses and Wodan then magically conjure a healing spell for the horse, and among these goddesses is a woman named Vola in Old High German, which by all accounts seems to be the exact same word as Old Norse Fula, and who we are told in this charm is the sister of Freya, the Old High German equivalent of Frigg. So now we have a clue that Fula actually did hold some importance that has been lost to us in modern times, and we don't attempt to merge her together with some other character or just breeze past her like she's a random side character that Snorri invented a backstory for. In that case, why would we assume that Snorri's information on Hleen is any less valid? Anyway, it's unfortunate that we have such little information about so many of these goddesses, but I hope you found this interesting as an insight into some of the lesser-known topics floating around in scholarly circles. One thing that's absolutely clear is that goddesses played a major role in the lived religion of Norse people and other related Germanic groups. There are a lot of factors that play into why most of the surviving myths focus more on men. Skalds were often composing for male leaders, for instance, among other social and cultural factors. But we should never forget that our sources attest more goddesses than gods. And if you took nothing else away from this episode, remember this. We don't have to smash all the goddesses together into a single character. Obscure as they might sometimes be, maybe it's best to let them exist the way we've been told they exist. And with that in mind, hopefully I'm not lying this time when I remind you to join me again next time as we begin to take our first steps towards Ragnarok on Norse Mythology, The Unofficial Guide. Sources for this episode include Germania by Publius Cornelius Tacitus, 1st century. Four papers all by Joseph S. Hopkins. Great Goddess Theory in Ancient Germanic Studies, 2019. Goddesses Unknown 1, Njordun and the Sister Wife of Njordur, 2012. Goddesses Unknown 2, on the apparent Old Norse goddess Ilmer, 2014. Goddesses Unknown 3, on the identity of the Old Norse goddess Hleen, 2017. Heimskringla, translated by Allison Finley and Anthony Falks, 2011. Meeting the Other in Norse Myth and Legend by John McKinnell, 2005. The Poetic Edda, translated by Caroline Larrington, 2014. And the Prose Edda, translated by Anthony Falks, 1995.